okay. Um, so thank you all for coming out. Um, I will be continuing to uh, look for people in the in the waiting room to make sure I'm admitting them in. But um, today we're going to be reviewing some community maps over economic and demographic data, um, having a, pre a presentation with uh, Neighborhood Housing Services. Um, Deborah Moore has joined us um, on the overview of the long-term homeowner grants. Um, and then talking about how we can uh, co-develop an outreach strategy and add to the work um, that NHS is doing for, for this work. Um, but I do see that Commissioner Navarro is on and Alderwoman uh, Hairston and, and Taylor are on. So I guess if uh, um, Commissioner, if you'd want to provide a, a welcome before we get started. Uh, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Aaron. And good I think evening, you everyone. are, you're not muted, but we can't hear you. Maybe it's just better? me. Is that better? Um, Can everyone else hear? I think it may yeah, be just right. me. Yeah, I can hear. Okay, we decided it's just you, Aaron. We, uh, you know, this is a new way for the city to interact with uh, community residents to work together to roll out, to not just create the ordinance, but to work together to roll out the actual programs within the ordinance and uh, to really learn from you how best to do that in each instance, working closely with each aldermanic office as well. So um, we're all kind of figuring out how to do this together. We hope to use this as a model in other places. So we appreciate you. Um, you know, sticking with us, give a, giving us feedback um, and, and working closely with us uh, to figure out how to do each one of these. And great to see my friend Deborah Moore. Um, she's done great work at NHS and I think we'll learn a lot from how they've rolled out this program and made it work in other places and, and what we need to do to make it fit here. We know each neighborhood is different and um, folks need to hear things in certain ways or from certain people. And that's, that's exactly how we, how we need to work together to figure out what that should look like in Woodlawn. So I'll turn it back over um, to Aaron and the older women to, uh, to keep the meeting going. I have a six o'clock, so I'm gonna jump off at that point as well, but I'm happy to join just for the beginning. Thank you. Yes, and I guess uh, Alderwoman uh, Hairston, would you like to say anything? Um, I'd just like to uh, welcome everybody and uh, thank you for your time commitment. Um, we know that as the weather warms up, people want to do other things, but it's really important that we continue to have you and continue to get your input. So uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you. And then Alderwoman Taylor, did you, would you like to say anything? Good evening, everybody. Um, I will echo what Aldo Emma Harrison said and Commissioner Navarro, hey, Commissioner Navarro, and say in a while. Thank you all for your commitment to this and getting on the call so that we can get this right. And while I do realize that this takes time away from your families and things that you ultimately be, need to be doing, this is important. And I'm just appreciative that you all have come to the table to work alongside us. And so I will be here listening. Thank you. So, um, like I said today, one of the things that you all had asked me for us was um, data and that we're making data informed decisions. Um, so today we'll do, you know, this introduction, we'll review these Woodlawn demographic and economic maps. I think this will be, this was something that you all mentioned you did in the previous um, for the crafting of the ordinance. I think it would be helpful, especially as we um, we have our conversation today about how to implement and conduct outreach um, for us to review these maps. Um, I will also say we're joined with Naaman Freeman, who is a consultant who's working with us with, from Bloomberg Associates, who's helped develop these data um, maps and can 
uh, also dig into some deeper conversations with the data. We'll have a presentation from NHS on the long-term homeowner grants and how they've worked in other places and what they typically do. And then we'll have time for a discussion um, for, for how we can implement and work these, this together. I will say um, when we're reviewing the maps, uh, feel free to put your thoughts and comments in the chat um, and um, or stop along the way to provide your thoughts. Um, so as again, just be, be sure to type your name and organization or your connection to Woodlawn in the chat box. And just a reminder that we are recording this meeting. So um, I have for us here, uh, the AMI levels. So a lot of the programs that we talk about um, are through um, area median income levels. <clears throat> so here are our current levels. Here's the 30% area median income, which are like our reserved lots um, target people at the 30% and the 50% area median income. Um, and then some of our other programs target at around the 60, 80, and 100 to 120. Over here, the in income level is based off of the um, the family size, so it does vary for how large your your family is. But these are, are couching these in this this conversation. Um, I did email to you all the most up to date um, area median income chart, as well as an overview of the um, a more detailed summary of each program. Um, in the uh, after our last meeting, I can send that out again if if people need to have that bumped up in their inbox though. So um, we have about like five or so map, five or six maps that we that I want to show um, to you all today. So one is just like helping get us understanding. And I would just say is, um, is there anything that resonates with you while we're going through these maps? Feel, feel free to say that. Or if something just seems a little off, feel free to also like uh, unmute yourself and, and talk about that. And so um, I'll also know there's people on the phone. So I'll just try to describe what we're looking at on the map. So this first map that we're looking at is the percentage of all, all households with incomes less than $25,000. And this is a time period between 2015 to 2019. That's the most recent uh, data that we have. Um, in the left panel, we have the citywide data, which is about 24% of uh, city residents make uh, households, I should say, make less than $25,000. And for the metropolitan area, it's 17%. Um, what it shows is that the further, um, well, there's a, a number of, they're broken down by like block uh, census tracts, which are like a number of blocks and areas. Um, so what we can see on this is toward the Western end, um, we have around 50% to 45% of these communities, um, people are, of households are making less than $25,000 a year. Um, that's also on the west side when we have in the middle, we have more places that are around 25 to 50 to 49% um, of these households are making less than $25,000. So <clears throat> again, if there's anything that resonates with you or any questions that you have, feel free to unmute yourself um, and bring those up. If not, I will sit on this map for just a little bit longer and then move on to the next one. Okay. I'll also say is that I know no one lives in the park. That's just how the census data is captured. So it look it carries into the park, but no one lives there. <clears throat> yeah, Aaron? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, Dwayne. Uh, you be making this slide available to us? Yes, I will send out the slides um, uh, tomorrow morning at the latest. <clears throat> All right, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So here's the, it's a similar slide as the one that I just showed you, only instead of $25,000, it's showing households that make less than $50,000 a year, um, which for the city, in comparison to the city rate is around uh, 42% of households in the city of Chicago make less than $50,000 a year. And for the metropolitan area, um, it's around 36% make less than um, $50,000 a year. So what this shows, <clears throat> similar to that first map, is the western end, we have um, blocks around 75% or more of the households 
make uh, less than $50,000. Um, and then on the Eastern end, the closest to Jackson Park, we see um, that around 75% or more make less than $50,000. All the other spots, it's around 50 to 74% of the households make less than $50,000, except for um, one uh, area, narrow area um, on the Eastern side um, that makes, uh, that they say is the data shows around 24% or less of those households um, make less than $50,000 a year. Is that east of Woodlawn? Is that Woodlawn to Dorchester? I believe so. This north, you talking about this north south uh, street right here? Yeah, the western boundary for that pink area. I believe it's Woodlawn. It's got cut off by the, the title, but yes. Okay. No other questions? I'll keep moving to the next map. Um, so then this next map that I'm showing shows the estimated percent of all households that own a home. So if you're a homeowner and um, in the area. So what I what I think is important about this is as we think about the long term homeowner grant program and the CCLT, which is Chicago Community Land Trust opt in program, those are directed toward homeowners. So I think, you know, seeing where the higher percentage of um, homeowners might be helpful. We've also were able to see the income information prior to this. So what this map shows is that uh, south of 63rd, but east of Cottage, I mean west of Cottage Grove, we actually have a between 25% and 40 and 50% of the of the households there are own are homeowners, um, and then that same section where we saw the the, the higher income people um, east of, of Woodlawn, we see. Um, that there's 50% or more are, are homeowners. For the rest of the community, we see around 10% um, to 25% are homeowners when some pockets of, nine, of less than 9% of the, the, of the households in that area are homeowners. Any questions with this one or comments or concerns? So when you, when you, does the data indicate, Aaron, if we're talking two flats or a single family? This map does not uh, distinguish between uh, building size and name and if you're online, if you can yep. correct me if I'm, okay. And, and, no, and it, just, let me clarify my question. So I'm just wondering if a two flat would be included in home ownership as it's described here. So this is purely about the households and their home ownership rate. So if the household resides in this area within Woodlawn and owns the home in which they reside in, they're captured in this data. Got it. Regardless of a two flat or a four flat or whatever. Right. So they yes. could, could be renting out units within their the property that they own, but they are, a, a, they are they own the home and they reside within the Woodlawn area. Thanks, Naaman. I, I do want to, Aaron. If I want to, I want to highlight before you move on. I think it's per the home ownership or the homeowner repair program. I think it was important to kind of highlight, uh, if you go back to the beginning, kind of what the AMI levels are and how those correspond, perhaps with uh, the income maps that we're showing. Right. So, mm -hmm. what are the limitations of the uh, home ownership repair program? And I think it is in that that AMI limits are, are they fifty percent of AMI? Not for the homeowners. For the homeowner program, it's, it's open to homeowners who just have lived in the community. And I believe they have, have to be around 120, less than 120% area median income, which um, I, for a fan, Excuse me, fan, let me just, yes, let me, since you were just showing this chart, just let me say that the, um, the 2021 chart is out and it is slightly okay. higher, which is really good because that means more people can qualify. So I just want to let you know, slightly higher. Um, so like if you look at a household of four at 120% is like 109 and it's up to probably like 115, around 115 or so oh, wow. um, for, for 2021. So I can send that out if people want to see that. I'll send it to you, Aaron. And when you send out the slides, if you could send that out. 
I'll happy. just replace the chart with the 2021. Okay. AMI level. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Can we look at that map again? Uh, the homeowner map? Yeah. So is this considering massing or density? No. Okay. It, um, Go ahead, name it. No, it, it doesn't consider kind of the density of, of the built kind of structures in, within these blocks. It's simply, you know, the data reflects the households that are living there, right? And so, and the percentage of those households that are homeowners. So it doesn't reflect any building characteristics. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on to our next map. Um, so this is the percent of all people under the age of 18 in the, that reside in, the, in these households. <clears throat> so for the city, citywide, um, it's around 20, 21%. And for the metropolitan area, it's around 23%. Um, um, what this is showing is that we have, I mean, most, uh, okay. We have large pockets where it's 20 or even 30% or more in the community. And then outside of those pockets, it's around 10 to 20%. Um, it seems to be fairly distributed across the neighborhood of having um, around 20% to 30%. Um, and it looks to be that some of the areas where there were higher rates of home ownership to be um, the ones that have around 30% or more um, households that I would say probably have children uh, that it's listed as people who are under the age of 18. So this is, share this map just so we can get a concept of where, you know, what the different type uh, family makeups are across the neighborhood. I would say the next map is, um, are there any questions about this one before I move on to the next one? So for me, I mean, I would want to understand massing and density. So for instance, on 65th and, and Drexel, on the north side of the street, there is um, a number of rental units. No, 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 um, no, and I'm no. sure there are families, you know, with children. So that's the only reason I keep asking about massing and density because it can be attributed to more than just for sale or home ownership units. Yeah, and this is this is showing, so this is from, this is census data or from the Census Bureau data that we're looking at. So it's, it's uh, who all lived, you know, at that location when they, when they were doing their, their information. Um, we just don't have the most recent census data yet, so this is what we're using as the American Community Survey estimates um, here. But that that makes total sense of um, trying to also know, you know, what what the density is in, in each each place. I do have some like additional maps that have to do, um, that are in what I'll send out to you all, which are part of this um, that doesn't actually get to density, but I will. We can look into to, to the density question as well. Uh, this is the, the same as similar as the map that I just showed before, only instead of people um, 18 and under, it's 65 and older. Um, so what this shows is um, on the very, very eastern edge, we have um, some pockets of 15 to 21% or 21% or greater. Um, and at the southwestern edge, we have some 21% or greater, and then on the western edge, we have a little few pockets of 21% or greater and some 15 to 21%. Um, majority of the neighborhood, I would say, has around 10% or less or 10 to 15%. But these are some places where we may want to um, target some of the programs if we want to make sure that we're reaching this, the seniors um, as well. Um, Citywide, it looks around about 13% of the city are older than 65% based on our, 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 our available data. Any Aaron, other? This, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this is, census, this is census tracts. So I'm gonna say that you're looking Correct. at 
all anybody who filled the census out that was of that age and not just necessarily senior buildings. I just want to clear, make sure we're clear on that. That is correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, and so this one's a little bit more busy, but it shows where, um, so the diamonds, which are these little diamonds right here, show if it's either a light tech building, which are um, low income housing tax credit buildings, um, which would be to say legally restricted uh, affordable housing, HUD uh, public housing or HUD multi housing, which is project based, you know, section eights. So this is showing where it's located and the purple shaded areas are buildings with three or more units. So if you're looking over here, um, where it's more than 60% of the buildings in that census tract ha has three units or more larger buildings. Um, so I think this is helpful for us to, as we think about when we will think about the, the pair program, um, you know, and like maybe some of these may potentially be, you know, buildings that we'd want to keep affordable as they may be nearing their, their end of affordability, or um, as we're thinking about because pair is for multi-unit buildings, um, thinking about where we'd want to target that. Um, as we think about targeting maybe some outreach around the loan fund for um, rehab or new construction, maybe some places we want to target that. Um, and then also targeting our tenant right of first refusal outreach, which is the outreach for, um, for people who live in buildings with nine or more units, they get the first right of refusal for, for purchase. So that's where I'm sending this, showing this map um, here. Um, but it also may help us think about, we can see that there are some pockets of um, government uh, backed affordable housing here um, and some pockets here. So if we're thinking about maybe distribution of where for those located, that may also be a thought that we, we have. Um, so overall, I guess, opening up the conversation as, um, and I'll stop sharing my screen so we can see each other, um, is more so as do these maps actually show where most of the homeowners and low income residents are located based on your own experience and knowledge. Um, are there any concentrations or vulnerable areas that don't show up in this uh, data or maps? And then where are you most concerned about homeowners being displaced or targeted? So I'm stopping sharing my screen so that we can look at each other while we talk. So Aaron, I would say, uh, responding to your last question, uh, that where you see a number of seniors, mm -hmm. um, that would probably be the place, seniors who are homeowners, that would be a vulnerable population. You know, as prices begin to rise, if they're on a fixed income, I would think that they would have uh, the greatest challenge. And then Jean, um, so maybe you should share kind of what we're seeing in terms of building code violation. Can you repeat that, Maya? Was that Maya that was talking about the building code violations? Yeah, Jean has been on fire about this, but I know more and more neighbors are affected. What, what, what are we saying, Maya? This is Jean Clark. And what we have been noticing is that a lot more of my neighbors are speaking about trying to have building code inspections, have to clear them up and they're fighting them, but they're winning so far, but I know it's going to get to be more. As I see people walking down our street, Looking, I asked, I said, what are you looking for? They're just looking. But I'm pretty sure they are the ones that's reporting the violations that they see. And my question is, how do we stop it? What do we do? Okay. Um, I know personally, so we've, uh, neighbors that I've talked to, we continue to get a high number of phone calls and um, mailings asking if we're interested in selling our homes. And I think it is puzzling that, that we're seeing more of our properties uh, having building code violations. 
And I think Mary Lightfoot had said that if someone could contacted you and you said no, they were not supposed to contact you again for 180 days. So I've gotten to the point where I tell them, in the event you call me back, I'm going to report you to my attorney as harassment. And that kind of slows the calls down in one way, but they're not going to stop. Yes, we do have an ordinance uh, for people being harassed. So I can also send out that information um, to this group, but that is good. Miss Jean, can you tell me what around what block, I'm like, sorry if you put it in the chat so I can look back and see it, but like where or what area you're in to make sure that we're um, being aware. It also sounds like if these are homeowners, that that would be a good place to target that outreach for um, the repair grants. I'm at 61st and Road, so I'm west in West Woodlawn. So between 60th and 63rd from Vernon over to Lee Champlain on Langley. I hear people are talking about it. We see people walking down our streets and we don't know what they're doing. And then I talked to Maya yesterday and apparently they're experiencing the same thing with large repairs on 65th and Minerva around that area. So it's like they're all over. The whole whole neighborhood. Thank you. Is that they're around the entire entire community? I think so. Okay. So 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 that kind of thing speaks. I've talked with Jean about this as well, and it, it and there was a posting on next door where a, 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 a homeowner talked about this, his experience with this. Uh, it sounds very scamish, right? People are walking through. And yeah. they, they will call the city and report uh, a violation because they may be interested in purchasing the par property or they don't think that the homeowner can uh, is properly managing the property. So there may be, I think we have to be very aware of, of the gamesmanship that people could play here and do things that are gonna protect the homeowner uh, and not allow the city to be used as a tool to edge that homeowner out of their, their homes. So, so it is something that, that we should absolutely be aware of, uh, talk about it and, and try to make sure. And, and Aaron, you know, I don't know how you balance what the building department does, but, but somehow they have to be brought to the table so that they are sensitive to these phone calls that they may be getting about homeowners in Woodlawn. Well, I do like the, sharing information and doing better messaging. I mean, people are very aggressive too. I had somebody knock on my door and when I told them to go away, they didn't. Wow, that's nervy, that's real nervy. They stayed on your it property? Happened. No, he just stood out on the sidewalk, kept waving and I'm like, no, I'm not interested. And he just kept standing out there. Well, the next time put the dogs on him, they're, they're putting the dogs on us. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave right now. I'm, I'm going to another meeting. But, you know, there's a, a general thing going on here. They're, they're trying to get rid of all of the, the uh, black people out of this neighborhood. We know that. Yeah, all I agree. I'll need to be very aware, very up on it. I'm sorry, I can't stay any longer. But um, the people who are renting are just as much in trouble as the homeowners. Right. We all have to be vigilant. You guys take care. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. What I've suggested we do is when I see a stranger walking on my block, I go out and I ask, can I help you? What are you looking for? And they'll tell you, oh, I'm just looking at admiring the beautiful building. So I call the police because there's a stranger on the block. I don't know what his intentions are. So I call 911 and hope they come. Yeah. Are there any other instances of um, areas of concentration or places where people might be more at risk at displacement? This is this is very helpful. Um, and then we can I can also take this back to uh, internally to see, you know, what. So I know we have the ordinance that protects people against harassment, but I also can see what other kind of resources we have. But uh, again, I think this is in a uh, perfect conversation that we're having today about the homeowner improvement grants because I think these are also the people we want to target to make sure that they are getting the resources uh, available to them to to be able to make their repairs to their building so they won't even 
so they know they're not going to have this issue with with uh, building code violations. Is there a way to look at data around that to see how many building code violations or citations might have been issued like in 2016 or 2017 compared to 2020 and 2021? Is it something we can monitor? I can, we can, we could pull the data for, um, so starting from like 2016 uh, through present. I'm just trying to, to understand what would be normal or typical and mm -hmm. when we could see it as a problem or when we might perceive it as a real issue. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to pull that information. I think it also is just helpful for us to know, for us to help target, you know, some of these repair programs toward because if they're if they're struggling to to keep up with maintenance i think those are the exact people that we'd want to to target these programs toward either the homeowners or the the multi-family building owners you know with our our rehab loan low interest rehab loan program i think similarly to what maya said i would suggest while it can be as formal as the city's record but i would suggest that if the neighbors when the neighbors are approached because I know I've heard seniors get phone calls. I hear they leave information in your doors. You get the phone calls. Mm -hmm. Start to record and track them and then share the information so you can know who's actually um, making these inquiries and where and how often. Because if they're coming to you, they may be going to somebody else. So I would say informally, I would say the um, neighbors just kind of keep that information and then try to bring it together and share it with one another and create somewhat of a database around it. Great idea. I do want to. Um, I want to be mindful of our time because we're going to have uh, Deborah Moore from NHS present. So I'm going to give us three more minutes in this conversation. Um, Deborah can present about more details about the homeowner uh, improvement grant program, and then we can have a further conversation about how to how we can reach uh, people who are very vulnerable. What other additional data we need to bring and then what resources um, we can collectively provide and then what support we might need um, to also help carry this through. But this is this is a great conversation. I don't wanna cut us off, but just wanna make sure that we keep uh, on track with things today. I also seen that a couple of people just joined. So if you just joined um, that I just admitted you in, please, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, thank you for taking the time, but please put your, uh, name and your connection or organization to Woodlawn in the chat box. Hey everybody, it's Naomi. You'll find that some of the people I think we're referring to are members of, of, my, uh, of my team working in West Woodlawn Institute for Community Control Development. Thanks for joining us, Naomi. Okay, well, I'm going to turn it over to Deborah um, to present on the uh, long term homeowner um, program. Thank you. And then I think you have the ability to share your screen. If not, I will make sure you do. Okay, I will. Um, so, first of all, I would just like to say, um, Thank you to the city, to Aaron, and to uh, Commissioner uh, Navarro for inviting me to present this to you today. And also would like to just acknowledge Alderwoman Taylor and um, Alderwoman um, Harrison. Good to see you guys. Um, I am going to share my screen now. Just give me a minute to figure out where it is. Okay, I uh, think you should be able to see that. Yeah, you can. Right, right. So um, <clears throat> basically, this is a, just a few slides. I'm going to go through um, sort of a high level overview of the program. Um, and then I will take questions. Um, and I'll probably have to uh, come back with some of the answers. I may have them, but um, I may not know all the answers right now. Um, but as you know, as Aaron said, um, this grant, and I'm looking over here because this is my monitor, so forgive me for that. 
But um, this is the long-term homeowner grant program. And so uh, NHS of Chicago will be monitoring this program oh. um, for the city of Chicago. The overall process of this is that we will be doing uh, marketing and outreach to all of the existing homeowners within the community. Those households will apply for a grant. Um, after they apply and approved, then there will be a site visit by the construction specialist. He will then develop a scope of work, after which there will be contractor bidding and selection of the contractor to do the work. The contract will be signed between the homeowner and the contractor. Permits will be drawn and then they will start the work. After the work has been completed and there's been a final inspection, the contractor will be paid and hopefully all the homeowners will have will be happy and have more equity in their home. So that's my goal. Help everybody. Um, so just with this conversation we're talking about, let's um, let's work to stay in Woodlawn and preserve our homes and home ownership. So, um, but with the marketing and the outreach, we're going we're working. I'm talking to Dwayne, and we're going to be working with the network of Woodlawn to help us provide this outreach, um, some door to door. We're also going to do a mailing to existing homeowners. If we get that list from the city, we're going to mail um, the information to every household. Um, uh, I talked about the door to door. Applications will also be available um, at Alderman Taylor's office, at the Woodlawn Resource Center on 61st and Cottage Grove, and at NHS Southside Hub on 87th Street, just, um, just west of Cottage Grove. And if you have any other places that you can recommend that we can put the applications and the uh, documents so that people can pick them up, um, let me know. I'd be more than happy to make sure that whatever organization or entity that is, that we get them um, applications. We'll also be an online process, but I just want to make sure that we have hard paper applications for those people who would prefer to um, apply manually. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the eligibility and the guidelines. So first of all, the property has to be within Woodlawn. Um, it has to be a one to four unit owner occupied as your principal residence. You have to meet the income guidelines that we just talked about up to 120% of AMI. Um, and that's for every person that's 18 or over that lives in the house. All everyone's income 18 and over has to be calculated to get to the household income. Um, you cannot owe the city of Chicago any water bills or uh, property taxes. Not property taxes, I think it's parking tickets. My mistake on this, this should not be property taxes, it's um, parking tickets. And the other thing is that if you got a grant um, the, that from the city of Chicago that was administered by NHS in the last five years, you would not be eligible for the program. Um, and that's all I really have. So if you have any questions on anything, I would be happy to take those. No questions? Okay. Well, I will stop sharing. Um, so um, I will just say that um, in terms of timing, um, I'm sure everybody really wanted to ask that question, but you did. <laughs> um, we are um, in the legal um, stage now of we have our contract from the city so we're um, you know have the little lawyer reviews and then get it back to the city and then we should be ready to start the hope is that we will definitely um, in May start our marketing and outreach um, hopefully with Dwayne and the um, other things it's so good to see Miss Clark on the call and um, also Lena I just want to say hi to you guys haven't seen you all in a while but it's really good to see you and Maya you as well 
Is this going to run like the TIF neighborhood improvement grants? If you get more applications and you have funding, will you do like a lottery type of thing? Or So thank you. That's a great question. Um, what we're going to do is this is going to be a first come, first serve. And the first come really means when you have submitted a complete application. So you have completed the application and all of the supporting documents. And once you have been approved, then you're in queue. So we will continue to just get people in, in the queue, even if the construction staff don't get to you. Once you've been approved, then you're gonna, you're in queue. You're going to get the grant, right? So then we'll just keep going like that until we reached. Um, the million dollars that has been allocated for this program. Muted. So I'm muted. My other questions that I have are in in regards to to this. So I guess I can just quickly share my screen of the other questions that I have. So um, as we think about it, are there any places where yeah, uh, Deborah kind of mentioned this, but any community organizations that have a strong presence or organizers have a strong presence that may to help us reach reach homeowners. Um, what organize, organizations are best uh, positioned to conduct outreach in identified areas? Um, when, if so, when could you start doing outreach, or could they start doing outreach, and who would be the best person to or contact person to coordinate? And then, what additional support might be necessary? So uh, if those help, um, those kind of questions of helping us think through this. Um, yeah, and that's going to be the case here with this little wave of rain coming in. It's going to be very intense. I think a lot of areas... I see you, Ms. Williams. I'll be sure to add your, uh, your email address to you. Um, I just saw in the chat someone suggested... Um, the UPS store as a place to leave applications is yeah. that yeah it's it was just a thought a lot of people go in and out and I know Rex is always going to try to be a, as much a part of the community as possible so I'm sure he'd be you know happy to yeah. okay great his name is Rex and which which store is that on cottage yes the UPS store right hot 63rd Okay. Back down from dailies. Okay. Thank you. Great suggestion. Uh, this is this is naming guys. I have a question for you all in terms of are there any um, is there any reason that people that may be aware of the program and are perhaps eligible for the program may be hesitant to submit an application, right? Um, are there any reasons that they they might you know might not be willing to um, you know, submit an application for this or enter into the program and, and are there any ways that we can help overcome overcome that? I think that's a great question. Um, it's, it's my understanding that uh, participation in the program, uh, a, a lien will be placed on the property, right? Is that correct? That's correct for, um, for five years. For five years. Yes. So, so some people may feel a special way about that, but to me, the scope of work or what you're, the work you're getting done through the grant, to me, outweighs that. But I think that could be a, um, you know, somewhat of a hurdle, a small hurdle to, to have to discuss with people so that they feel at ease with having a lien placed on their property. I don't know what some of the other residents might, how they might feel about that, but would like to hear what they have to say about that as well. Um, Jean, I think we should share it with our network of neighbors. Maya, I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Who can touch people at the block level? And is it is it more of a who's delivering the message that you know may help to you know, calm some of those fears, perhaps about yep. the lien being put on their property and who mm -hmm. are the people that should be giving that message and, you know, can we incorporate them in that process? It's all about relationships. It always is. Yep. I want to, it's Naomi and Big. 
I wanted to, to just volunteer our services. We've done a, um, a lot of door-to-door -door over the years and we have our uh, land stewards and landscaping course launching this, this weekend. We'll be out in the neighborhood. So we, uh, if there's literature that you want us to carry or message that you'd like for us to deliver, we're just geeked and delighted to do it. We live for it, so use us. Thank you, Naomi. Um, the pay, the, ap the application won't be any more than three pages. It hopefully will be less, but um, according to our contract with the city, it cannot be more than three pages, but hopefully it can even be less. So I'm really looking at how to make it as straightforward and um, easy as possible to apply. Because um, we really don't want the application process to be the hurdle. We want everybody who um, is qualified for the program to be able to um, get in the program without, we don't want our side of it to be the hindrance. So, so maybe one of the suggestions that we do is that we could maybe do a Zoom for people that are interested so that you could walk them through um, the application, or I don't know if we can get to a place where people can be socially distanced, where, you know, everybody is in the room and you kind of walk them through uh, yeah. so, that they're fam so that they can familiarize themselves with it. That's a very good uh, suggestion. And actually, I talked to Felicia today about using the Woodlawn Resource Center to have like 10 people at a time that yep. wanna come in and walk them through the application yep. and even scan their documents up so they don't have to worry about those and give them right back. Um, yep. Also, I can do Zoom. I thought about doing that. I didn't know I talked to, I think Dwayne, I talked to you about Dwayne doing some uh, Zooms to help people if enough people you think uh, would wanna get on Zoom to understand how to do the application process. So I didn't know. I, I think you both. I think you have more than one type of group. So you might have one group that is particularly savvy in, in, in computers and Zoom and everything. And then you might have another that can get on, but they really benefit from in person, from seeing, from you know, touching. So um I, I, I would suggest that we do both. I mean, because our goal is to make sure that everybody has all the information that they need. And um, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing that. Yes, okay, nice. it makes a lot of sense. Some people like we still like paper, so yeah. Right. Let's well, that's why yeah. that's why I'm putting all the paper applications. I would like to flood the community with paper <laughs> applications. <laughs> Flyers. I think, I think the other thing is you could do. I think two things to that point and to Joan, similar to Joan's question. I think if what I've heard from, believe it or not, what I've heard from homeowners is what type of information they have to give out, their personal information that they are a little challenged about. So that's the first thing. But I think giving out an FAQ sheet in terms of that lists out all the things that they have to have in order to apply. Mm -hmm. And you have a technology center. So if people want to apply in real time, you can also set up a spot or a time or intervals of times where people can come in and put in their applications in person with one of your staff people at the computers and then they can get in at that time and you can social distance it and and they could do it right there. I don't know right. if that's helpful, but you can also do that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can also let you all know that I, uh, a resident called called the department today and I was able to talk with them who are, who's interested in this program. So <laughs> people are finding out and uh, wanting to get, get involved. So I, I think it's a great time that we're talking about this. Um, the, the other thing, uh, Deborah, since I have you on, I, I would go ahead and extend an invitation to you for, we just had our what month is this? April ward meeting on Tuesday. So we won't have our next one till May so that we can make sure that we get you before um, the residents and we do record them. And so we can post them later so that people will also have access to that information. 
And that would be good by May. I'm sure I will have my FAQs and the applications. We would have signed, once we sign the contract with the city, then we'll be able to get those documents um, developed. So I should definitely have that by May. Is Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, May 26th? Let me check. I, I think it is May 26th. It's, it's the fourth Tuesday, everybody, but let me check. Yeah, I'm, I'm checked now. One, two, uh, 25th, yes, 25th. Okay, I'm putting my email in the chat. Okay. Yeah, this is great. I guess any anyone else on the, the call um, who we maybe haven't heard from ways that you think that um, we can make sure we're reaching the people who are, are most vulnerable or how it, the things that have been shared already landing with you all. Just, uh, just for clarity, uh, this grant is available to the entirety of Woodlawn, is that correct? We're not limited to any particular area of Woodlawn. Yeah, it's the whole community of Woodlawn, per the contract that I got, yes. Great, thank you. Okay, well, if there's nothing else on this item, this is what I have um, for this meeting. May, we're gonna, because we rescheduled uh, this meeting, so May, we're gonna have two meetings. <laughs> uh, I'll work with uh, the Alderwoman's office to get them scheduled um, for May. Um, one meeting will be on the PAIR program, which stands for Preserving Existing Affordable Rentals. So this seems also like an app conversation. I'm also following the timeline that you all created. Um, so I don't know, you all did a great job making a timeline because it's very timely. <laughs> so um, we'll be talking about the Preserving Existing Affordable Rentals, which um, looks, which is a program for buildings that already are affordable um, and that we can help refinance their their debt to keep them affordable um, for a longer longer term and help those help those building owners out. We'll be joined with um, Astra Sorrell from from the Department of Housing who runs that program who will do something similar like Dibros done, give you a brief overview um, and been able to share um, the ways in which we can do that. I say for that program itself, it's it's we need to help reaching the building owners who you all know um, already are already providing affordable rents or are the building owners that you know that may be uh, interested in doing this. Um, so that's, if you have those kind of thoughts or ideas, that would be great or how to reach those um, people, that would be great. Um, also in May, we'll be having the reservation of, of lots conversation, which is the ordinance um, has a reservation of 52 lots for um, people who are at the rentals, um, what the 50% and below area median income level. So we'll be having that conversation and, and choosing the lots that we'd like to reserve in May. So um, be on the lookout for those meetings. They seem like they're great meetings to have. Um, in the meantime, though, I'll send out the notes from this meeting, um, the recording um, by tomorrow, and then I'll be working in the ordinance around uh, harassment um, tomorrow. And in the meantime, I'll also connect internally with Department of Buildings just to see, you know, what other kind of support or resources we could provide for that. Um, okay. Um, Naomi had a question in the chat, and I heard something similar today. Yeah, I just wanted to mention since this is a housing centric group and we're all community and we all care that um, related Midwest did announce to some folks um, that they were selling Parkway Gardens and that Marcus and Milchap Affordable Housing in Detroit would be handling the transaction. Um, we, there, there's a group, the Institute for Community Control Development 
meeting every Thursday night. That's why I'm some of the team members are here tonight because we want to, you know, be clear about what neighbors and city are, are talking about at the housing meetings, but people are welcome to, you know, find a table and sit down and talk about what, what community wants. If you want to, you know, just text me or um, email me and um, let's convene a table and, and meet about it. Great. I oh, guess I, we, uh, so ahead. Sorry, Maya. I just thought it was important to continue to look at Parkway because its stabilization is um, key to some of the activity um, closer to King Drive. Some of the real estate activity or the strategy for for the area closer to King Drive. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I guess I mean, we have a little bit of time. So I guess if there's any other like community announcements that you all want to make around housing, I see Deborah has her hand up. <laughs> uh, yes, I wanted to say uh, in May, NHS is going to be administering a rental assistance and mortgage assistance program. So at the same time that we're doing the applications for the uh, home improvement grant or the home repair grant, we also can be, if people are, you know, need that assistance, we can also talk to them about that and get them into that program as well. And we'll, I'll give um, the materials and flyers. So if you know people who need it and um, it's, I think it's geared toward the landlords. Um, I think it's the one that we're gonna be working on is going to pay the landlords. And I think it's up to $25,000. So they will pay the rent in arrear as well as three months going forward. So uh, keep keep an eye out for that one. And then I guess Alderwoman Harrison mentioned that she has her May um, ward night on the 25th. I know Alderwoman Taylor has her ward night on the 27th and she highlighted that the buildings department will be there and DUH will also be there to talk about renters rights. Um, and I, I'm, I have a feeling it will be me because <laughs> I'm the person who talks about renters' rights, uh, but uh, also probably about the emergency assistance program that will be opening for the, the city um, as well. Also, I do talk a lot about uh, renters' rights and my other projects I do. Um, if that's helpful, I can send out some information around um, uh, COVID and the particular protections that people have um, for renters during COVID um, and the process, the protections around evictions right now, um, if people find themselves in that. So I'll probably be speaking, probably will be the person speaking to that um, on the 27th, but also I can share that out in the meantime, if, if, if that will be helpful for people. Okay. Well, I appreciate you all taking time on your out of your uh, out of your Thursday evening. Um, I enjoyed uh, enjoy all of your time that we have with one another, and we're really making progress um, and the work that we're doing. And as Commissioner Barra mentioned, like this is a learning opportunity for the Department of Housing to to do things in a more involved way. Um, so I really do appreciate you all uh, working with us to 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 do things uh, in a more involved and community-centered way. Um, thank you all and enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.